Okay, will you please welcome back to Cornerstone Church, David Wagner. Come on, will you give Jesus a shout of praise this morning? Come on, you can do better than that. Can you give Jesus a shout of praise this morning? Jesus, we love you, we lift you up, we magnify you, we declare there's no one like you, there's no one but you, that Lord, you're high and lifted up in the earth. And Lord, we know that if you would be high and lifted up, you'd draw all men unto yourself. And I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying that I'm coming again like a mighty rushing wind over this New England region. And I'm going to cause people to be swept off their feet and fall in love with me. For I'm making myself irresistible to a people who have been seeking me, even though they do not even know what they're seeking. For the Lord says that I'm getting ready to open eyes and open hearts and open ears, even in this region. And the Lord says, what others have given up on, I have stayed fast, uh, steadfast in and kept my focus on. For the Lord says, you'll actually watch a movement and an outpouring of my spirit once again on places like Yale and Harvard and places that many have counted me out. The Lord said, they can't push me out for I am in the foundation. And I saw the foundation of the Father I saw the foundation of the Father in America, and I saw the Lord beginning to, beginning to cause there to be not only a shaking in the earth, but a stirring. And I feel like the Lord is stirring up the promises in the hearts of his people, and he's stirring up the gifts and the, the promises of God uh, in his people once again. And I just feel like right now that we are on the cusp, on the edge, on the verge of watching the Lord usher us in to a global outpouring, to a global revival. And I believe it's not just about meetings, but it's actually about people meeting the Lord, not only in the church, but actually even in the streets. And I felt like the Lord said that even as you begin, as we celebrate 40 years, I feel like there is about to be a river that flows out of this place into the streets of Cheshire, into the streets of Connecticut, in the streets of the United States of America. And I just feel like the Lord is about to release a sound, not just from a worship team, but a sound from his people that it is going to release, like it's going to be a sound that's going to be heard around the world. It is a sound of unity but that unity is without compromise. And I felt like the Lord was getting ready to release the, the, the fires of purification upon the body of Christ in this season. That we're once again going to begin to experience the refiner's fire. That he's bringing forth the gold. And I feel like the Lord is actually anointing Cornerstone. He's anointing the church in New England to actually be those who, who can mine the gold out of this region. That, that which seems like it's buried under tons of, of dirt. We're going to begin to mine and see the gold that God has placed inside of this region. The, the scripture says, Jesus said these words, that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in, in a field and for the joy over it. A man sells everything he has to buy the field. And I just feel like the Lord has made Cornerstone a hallmark, a, a, a place of miracles. He, he's made you actually a, a cornerstone in this region of, of faith. And I, I just felt coming in today, I've been here many times, but I felt like the Lord was making this house like, like a, a gateway. Like there was a, 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 and I kept seeing Psalm 24, lift up your head, O ye gates, and open up your everlasting door that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong, mighty in battle. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I, the, Psalm 24 begins with, who will ascend the hill of the Lord? Those with pure hearts and clean hands. And so, Lord, I thank you for a pure-hearted people. Lord, I thank you for those of us that would hold out our hands and say, Lord, purify our hearts and cleanse our hands so that we may ascend the hill of the Lord, that we may be the, that which lifts up the gates and lifts up the heads of this region. Lord, thank you for 40 amazing, miraculous years. And Lord, we know in our hearts that the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Do you believe the word of the Lord this morning? Jesus, we believe your word. Lord, you watch over your word day and night, and you're careful to perform it. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that he's the God who speaks? Aren't you thankful that Jesus isn't dead in the grave somewhere? He's not a dumb idol. He's not made of stone. He's not just a figment of our imagination or, or a relic that we put up on, on a wall, but he's actually alive. I love the presence of God. Anybody love the presence of God? The presence of God so beautiful in the room this morning, in our worship, in our, in, in our, our time together. 
But how many know the presence of the Lord isn't the goosebump you feel or the, or the tingling that you feel? It's not a, a theology. It's not an ideology. But the presence of God is actually a person, and his name is Jesus. And I believe that Jesus is really here today. Anybody else believe that Jesus is really here today? I, in fact, I know that he's here today because I brought him with me. Anybody else bring Jesus with you? Right? He's on the inside of me. He walks with me. He talks with me. He's, he, he's a part of me. Jesus said in John 15 that I, if I abide in him, he would abide in me. How many know when you got born again, you didn't get little baby Jesus in the corner of your heart? I used to think that that was a cute little picture that Jesus in a manger lives in the corner of my heart. How many know he's so much bigger and better than that? I didn't get toddler Jesus. I didn't get teenage Jesus. But I got a full-grown, resurrected, filled with power from on high, Jesus Christ, living on the inside of me. The moment I got born again, he put his hands inside of my hands, his feet inside of my feet. He gave me the mind of Christ, the heart of God, and anointed me to be his mouthpiece, an oracle of God in the earth. That's who he is. A God without limitations puts himself in us. He dwells in us, which makes me feel the fear of the Lord on this to realize that I'm the only limitation God has. You're the only limitation that God has, and it's time to actually break the boxes and to lift the, 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 the limitations off of us. I'm thankful that this isn't some good story, that this isn't just some uh, historical figure that we talk about, but Jesus is alive and well, and if he wasn't, our meeting together would be in vain. How, how many know this isn't a temporary thing, this is an eternal thing? That we're actually a part of what Jesus said that he was building and doing in the earth. Not just from bricks and stones and creating a, a, an environment for us to come in that was, you know, uh, we have air conditioning and when it's hot outside and heat when it's cold outside and padded seats for the meat, right? Uh, I'm thankful for that. But, but the Lord didn't create the church for that we will be comfortable. He created the church to equip us, to empower us, to, to then launch us out and send us out, whether it be to our neighbor or to our ne and to the nations of the earth. Can I tell you something? Every one of us in this room is called by God and chosen. Every one of you is called by God and chosen. Some of us are called to our neighbors and some of us are called to the nation. Some of us are called to both. And either, no matter what the calling is, it's significant to God. I want you to know that we are living in significant days. We are living in amazing days. We're actually living in the days that Joel the prophet in Joel chapter 2 talked about, that Acts chapter 2 talked about, that afterwards he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. Our sons and daughters would prophesy. Our old men would dream dreams. Young men would have visions. And I believe that the Lord is actually bringing us into a new season of dreaming with God and seeing what God sees, of declaring the word and the works of God. Because we are living in amazing days. I believe we're actually living in the days that Paul the Apostle, that Peter, James, John, all of the disciples would be jealous to be living in the moment that we're living in right now. Because in moments like these, Jesus always comes. Jesus was born in the midst of a pandemic. He was born in the midst of civil unrest. He was born in the midst of uh, uh, government corruption. He was born in the midst where everything was uncertain and being shaken. And Jesus always comes in moments like this. The book of Acts, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the early church was built in moments like this. We were created for moments like this. I believe that if you want to know what God's about to do, that you should look at what the enemy's trying to do. There's always a counterfeit before the real thing. And we've lived through the counterfeit of, a, of, of, of the enemy trying to put all kinds of sickness, disease, pandemic upon the earth. It, he just showed his cards. It tells me exactly what God's about to do, that in the midst of it, he's about, that the Lord himself is about to release a, a healing outpouring that has been never seen before in the earth and in the streets. Anybody excited about that? In the midst of a world that's been gripped with fear, it tells me that we're about to see an outpouring of perfect love because perfect love casts out all fear. In the midst of all of the, 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 all of the uh, uh, 
disunity and all of the angst and all of the, what would seem aggression and the turning of people against each other based on the color of skin and political affiliation and all of those things, it tells me that God is about to work and release a movement of unity without compromise like the earth has never seen, where black and white and Hispanic and Asian and all the colors of the world come together. It's amazing to me. It's amazing to me because I believe that the Lord is actually releasing the body of Christ. I look around the room and I'm so thankful that I'm not in a room just filled with vanilla. It's, it's beautiful when you look out and you see all the, the shades of, 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 of people, all of the different uh, demographics, all the different of nationalities, and all the difference of, uh, of the beautiful colors of our skins. I get excited about that because it looks like heaven to me. You know what all wars are fought about? Dirt. It's all about dirt. It's all about this ground and that ground. You know how we have all the colors that we have in the earth? Dirt. We were just created from different colored dirt. Isn't that beautiful? That, that God actually just says, hey, you know what? I'm going to take this people and this people. I'm going to mix it all up and create this color, this shade. Of, why? Because I want a unity. I want something that looks and expresses and creates like the kingdom of God. Aren't you thankful for that? Here, here's what I'm saying. It is the Lord loves diversity because diversity actually brings unity. It's where you actually get the words university. Unity, unity and diversity. But the way that you achieve true diversity and unity is this. You come together around a common cause, a, a common theme, and his name is Jesus. Different shades of skin, same blood flowing through us. Isn't it gorgeous? Uh, don't you love the body of Christ? Don't you love the expressions of God all around us? And that's the beauty of what God is doing in Cornerstone Church. It's the beauty of what he's doing in the earth. So when the enemy wants to throw all that stuff at us, I would like to take a picture of this moment and just say, here, devil, you're not winning at all. Aren't you thankful for that? For, for a church that looks like the kingdom. Come on, I believe that we are living in these days where we're going to watch an outpouring of healing, outpouring of perfect love, an outpouring of unity without compromise. Aren't you thankful? I'm so thankful. I believe that thankfulness, even that song we were thinking, singing about gratitude, I, I believe that's how we're supposed to come in. We enter his gates with thanksgiving. Come on, you're gate busters. When you come in, and you come in with thankfulness, well, Lord, I know it's been a hard week, but I have breath this morning. I was able to get out of bed this morning. I was able to drive my car this morning. Gas prices are going down this morning. Uh, the, the building was open this morning. And you begin to come in with great, how many know that the gates begin to come off the hinges? Amen. We thank him for what he's done. I'm just telling you right, right now that the Lord is bringing us into a season of thanksgiving like never before because it's ushering us in to presence. I believe there's a sound of worship that's going to come out of New England. I believe there's a sound of worship that's going to sweep out of New England into the, through the United States. And it's going to release an awakening. Aren't you thankful for that? I'm prophesying to you this morning. It's not wishful thinking. That there's a part of me that's jealous for you because I don't get to live here. Let me say that again. That there's a part of me that, that has a godly jealousy because I don't get to live here. I'm jealous of you because you get to live here. Four of you are happy that you live in Connecticut. <laughs> so, well, it's hard ground, the, 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 the blah, blah, blah. I wasn't speaking in tongues. I'm simply saying that sometimes we get so caught up in what's happening in the atmosphere, we forget the God who rules and reigns over the atmosphere. Are, are you hearing me today? And I'm telling you right now that there is an amazing move of God that's going to come through New England because God promised it. Amen. And there's nothing the enemy can do about it. There's nothing that a politician can do about it. It's nothing that the economy can't do about it. He's going to do it. I'm just telling you right now, in my heart of hearts, I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Isaiah 60 says, Arise and shine, 
for the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And although darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people, his glory will be seen upon you and even the kings of the earth will come to the brightness of your shining. Cornerstone Church, this is your time to shine. I love the idea of awakening. It's like the sound of an alarm clock going off. Right? How many know when that alarm clock goes off, you have a choice to make? Wake up or hit the snooze. Right? But what happens after you wake up? You actually have to, to make the decision to get out of bed. And I believe that the Lord is, is really, he's waking America up. He's waking the church up. But now we must take the next steps and actually put our feet on the ground. There's an awakening and there's a, an arising. There's an awakening and an arising. One thing is God, God is doing and the other thing God is asking us to partner with him in getting up. Some of you right now, the Lord is calling you to rise up. He's calling you to put your feet on the ground and every time you hit the feet and uh, put your feet on the ground, you begin to release a move of God in the earth. I, I'm excited about that. Arise and shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That's who you're called to be as Cornerstone Church. To be a city set on a hill whose light cannot be hidden. That people that are in darkness can see the brightness of your shining in the distance and say, there's hope over here. There's healing over here. I, I see something that I, I haven't seen before. And there's going to be a drawing in of things like you've never known before. Anybody else in the, in the last couple of years maybe have felt a little bit hopeless, a little bit frustrated, a little bit uh, uh, caught up in the swirl of what was happening in, in our nation and in our region and in the world around us. Any, anybody else can relate to that? Anybody felt like you were held back or pulled back or like the wind got taken out of your sails? Can, can anybody relate? I believe this, that, that the Lord is actually about to make up for lost time. So I have a son who's 20. His name is Caleb, and he's all things outdoors. He loves fishing. He loves hunting and those things. And, and last year, he, he took up archery, he took up bow hunting. And I, I, it was something I never got into, but I've been watching him practice his craft, so to speak. And I've been noticing what he, what he does is, is that his greatest place of accuracy and his greatest place of, of, of productivity in the sport is in the greatest place of tension. He puts the, bow in the, in, uh, he puts the arrow in the bow and he pulls it back to the place where you can almost see his, his arm shaking because of the tension. And he lines it up with his eye and he lines his eye on the bullseye on the target. And in that place of greatest tension, there's an alignment, a drawing to his eye. And then he releases it and it hits the bullseye. When we feel tension, our normal response is, Lord, what's wrong? Can anybody relate to that? You feel pressure, you feel tension, and our first response is, Lord, what, what's wrong? Something's wrong here. And actually, tension doesn't mean something's wrong, it just means that something's happening. So my response needs to be, instead of what's wrong, Lord, what are you doing? What's happening right now? Here's where I believe prophetically, the Lord is drawing us back to his eye. You're not being pulled back, held back, you're being drawn back to his eye because the Lord is aiming you at the target and you're about to hit the spot. Some of you right now, you, you need to understand that the Lord has you right where he wants you. He's drawing you back to his eye. He's giving you a new perspective. Prophetically, I believe this. You do not need to be prophetic to know that there's a problem. Turn on your TV, to open your phone. Every five minutes there's a notification of somebody dying, some bomb going off, somebody getting hurt, some politician saying one thing, another politician contradicting it over here. And, and all of it is buying for our attention. And I'm telling you right now that over the last couple of years, in the midst of all of this stuff, the church has gotten totally distracted. And the Lord is drawing us back to his eyes so that we can actually see the target again. That, that we can actually stop shooting at each other and actually know how, that, how to take out the enemy. That the Lord is actually adjusting our eye, that we could actually have the solution. And that's what I believe the Lord is calling us to be in the church, is to actually be kingdom solutionists. 
How many know that we have the answer to what the world's looking for right now? Healing and hope. A couple of years ago, I was on an airplane uh, from, from uh, LaGuardia to Atlanta, and I'm, I'm sitting next to a, a, a guy, and I'm just enjoying my orange juice, and I was upgraded to first class, which is always a, a, a good thing. It's better than middle class or last class. Uh, first class is, is not, not what it used to be, but it's still good. Uh, and, and I'm sitting there, and a guy gets in the seat next to me, and we just have some chit-chat going on, and we take off. And as we're talking, and you know, I introduce myself, he introduces himself, uh, and um, he, he goes, so what do you do? How do you describe what I do when three-quarters of the church doesn't even believe I exist? I am a revelatory, motivational speaker. I like to encourage people in the Lord. Uh, you know, I just told him, listen, I, I have this ama- I'm a minister. I have this amazing gift that the Lord's given me, and I get to just hear what the heart of God is saying for people. And he said, well, that's really interesting. I'm an atheist. <laughs> and, and he was the nicest atheist I ever met. <laughs> he wasn't combative. He wasn't argumentative. He was, he, he was actually just inquiring, just asking me questions. And uh, in, the, in the midst of it, uh, so in the midst of it, I kind of came up with this little bit with him. And I, when he told me he was an atheist, I said, that's impossible. You don't exist. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? I'm sitting right here. I said, no, you don't exist. He said, I'm sitting right here. I told you my name. You shook my hand. You know that I'm here. I said, no, I don't believe in atheists. Therefore, you don't exist. He said, you got me, and he stayed nice, so I was thankful. <laughs> we, we, we were just talking, and he was listening to something. I kind of was listening and reading some things. And halfway through the flight, the Lord puts this impression. He speaks to my heart about uh, this man having a daughter who was 17. Uh, her name was Lydia, and she was anorexic. And that this man had spent everything he could in the finest of, of clinics and treatments to get her healed up and whole, but she, she uh, wasn't getting any better, but was actually getting worse. And she was at the point where her body was actually shutting down. And so I, I spelt faith like this, R-I-S-K, risk. Because I'd rather be found looking foolish in faith than looking all put together in doubt and unbelief. And so I just said, hey man, do you have a daughter? He said, yeah. Wow, that's weird. How do you know? I said, is she 17? He said, how do you know? I said, is her name Lydia? How do you know my Lydia? And I said, I I don't know your Lydia, man. I I just know that God knows her, and he's speaking to me about her, and he's pretty mad because it's a sensitive subject. And I said, is she anorexic? How do you know my Lydia? I said, the Lord loves you, and he reveals to heal. And I said, have you spent everything you can and the best and the finest of treatments and clinics and everything to get her whole, but she's not getting whole, she's getting worse. And he just starts weeping. And I just start ministering the love of God to him and start talking to him and praying with him. And How many know the Lord knows right where you're at? He knows where you're at on the airplane. He knows where you're at in the gas station. He knows where you're at in the, in, in, in the grocery store. He knows where you're at in your life. How many know that he puts hungry people in your path? On the airplane, in the restaurant, in the grocery store. And sometimes you feel things and we don't act on them because we don't want to miss it. And I just start ministering to the guy and, and, and I wish I could tell you that I was able to go right for the hook, you know, and reel him in and make him pray a prayer. But he wasn't ready for that. He, he, he was captivated because the Lord was speaking he, he was willing to, to realize that, that I couldn't know any of this stuff sitting next to him randomly. And he began to open his ideas to the, to, to the idea of faith. There are people that you'll win right away. And there's people you have to choose just to do, start doing life with. So exchange information over a period of time. The Lord really began to work and heal his daughter. And six months after that encounter, he, led, he gave his life to the Lord. And I'm, I'm sharing this with you because it's really, really important. We, we get overwhelmed 
by the masses of humanity. We get overwhelmed by, by this large world we're living in and this idea of, of the world's going to hell in a handbasket and what are we going to do and how are we going to navigate it all and, and all of those things. Can, can anybody relate to that? About uh, 12 years ago, I was in a crash landing of, a, of an airplane in Uganda. Got to come down on the slides and all of that. It was really fun. Um, <laughs> I always wanted to do that, just not on a plane that was almost crashed, you know. And uh, I, I ended up on that trip with cerebral malaria. Uh, and and I, I actually almost died three different times. And in one of those times, the Lord Jesus came to me. I don't know if it was a dream or a vision. It was my reality. And in the dream or the vision or my reality, Jesus took me and we went, I call it my Peter Pan moment. We would just, I was holding his hand and we would, we would kind of fl fly effortlessly and we would stop over like masses of humanity, big cities, uh, wherever there were lots of people. And, and we would kind of zoom in on it. And Jesus would ask me this question, how are we going to win them all? And I, I, I like to respond like Ezekiel, Lord, only you know. Like, I don't want to get this wrong. Lord, only you know. And this is what he would say gently to me. Here's how we're going to win them all, by loving them one at a time. By loving them one at a time. I love big events where thousands of people come to the Lord. There's times and seasons for that. But in what Jesus just said, we're going to win them all by loving them one at a time, tells me this. That it's not just going to be through my ministry or through people in ministry. It's actually going to be by, by the church actually being ministers. Are there any full-time Christians in the room this morning? Good. Half of us are full-time part-timers. Any part-time Christians in the, in the room this morning? I have a prophetic word for you. If you're a full-time Christian, you're in full-time ministry. If you're a full-time Christian, you're, in full, you're a full-time minister. Well, I, I don't preach. Let your life speak. Love people well. See a need. Meet the need. It's how we change the world one life at a time. Does, does this make sense to you today? I've been captivated recently uh, in, in simply in the Gospels. Anybody else love the Gospels? And what I love about the Gospels is this, is you cannot improve on the methods of Jesus. We make things so complicated. We program people, but we don't really pastor people. We, we create a program or a track or something for, for you all to kind of to figure it out instead of actually just doing what Jesus did, which he would actually get to know people. He would sit with them. He, he would meet their needs. He would feed them. He would love on them. He would bring healing to them. And then he just started doing life with them. And somehow we want to just put things in the microwave and go, this is how you do it. And I'm telling you that it's one of the reasons why small groups are so important. This isn't a public service announcement. I'm not an actor hired for the commercial. But it's really about community. It's about coming together around tables. It's about actually finding people of like precious faith and doing life together. Because it's what the kingdom looks like, going both in the synagogue or in the church and, and in house to house. Is that, does that make sense to you? And Jesus would actually sit with people. The early church would sit with people. They, they would meet their needs. They, they would love on them, bring healing to them, hope to them. And then they preach the gospel to them. What we like to do is preach to people, get the miracle, give a big old testimony. And then let people just kind of assimilate. But here's what discipleship really is. Here's what Christianity is really all about. It's teaching people how to live a God kind of life. It's teaching people how to live a God kind of life. And every one of us is being anointed for that. I read to you, uh, quoted to you Isaiah 60. I'll, I'll quote to you now Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon you. He has anointed you to preach good news to the poor, 
to bind up the brokenhearted and set the captive free. The Holy Spirit is in me for me. He convicts me of my sin. He comforts me. He befriends me. He speaks with me. He, uh, he, he's amazing on the inside of me, but he's in me for me. But he's upon me for the world around me. Holy Spirit is in you for you, but he's upon you for everyone around you. And Cornerstone, in this new season of the church, the Lord is coming upon us to, to release good news to the poor, good news to those who don't know Jesus, good news to those who are hurting and lost, that you can be healed, that you can be whole, that you can come to the altar and God can, can, can heal you and do amazing things, not only in you and for you, but with you. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Aren't you thankful for, for a God who loves us and, and he, 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 he chooses to dwell on the inside of us? Where was the first sanctuary? I believe it was the Garden of Eden. More specifically, I believe Adam was the first dwelling place of God. His desire always was to put his presence on us and in us. He, he built this church that we can corporately and collectively bring it together because every joint supplies. Isn't that beautiful? But, but he also was saying, hey, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the church outside of the walls. It's too good to keep it in here. Would you agree with me on that? Would you agree with me on that? I believe the Lord is, is, is up to something phenomenally amazing in us, with us, and for us in this season. Many of us are about to experience the Lord redeeming and saving entire families. How many people would agree with that? So I had an amazing, beautiful mother. She was 84 years old when she went home to be with the Lord last November 14th. And my mother wasn't perfect, but she was perfect for me. She was pure-hearted. I created this word for her called perfect because she was pure and she was perfect for me. And her testimony was she knew the Lord all the days of her life. She walked with God all the days of her life. How many know that's an amazing testimony? That's a really amazing, that's probably the best testimony I ever heard because that's the testimony I want for my children. That they walked with God all the days of their life. Can you believe with me for a generation that would just know and walk with God all the days of their life? That doesn't have to walk through the stuff we've had to walk through? That's what, and, and my mother did that. My mother prayed me out of hell. Eric said it brilliantly the other day when we were talking. He said, your mother got to see you born twice. The day you were born and the day you were born again. And I think that's really amazing. So I've given him credit for that twice now, yesterday and, and today. And after that, it belongs to me. Okay? <laughs> my wife, my, my mother endured abuse. My mother endured hardships and the Great Depression. And, and, and uh, as a child of immigrants, all of those things. But at the end of my mother's life, She had no regrets and no debt. And every one of her children were born again. How many know that's a pretty amazing life? It's a pretty amazing way to leave the earth. And can I tell you something? I believe that statement is really important for the church. How many know the Lord's not after a successful church? The Lord's not building a successful church. He's not calling me to have a successful life. He created me and made a way for us to have a victorious church and for us to live a victorious life. He's not coming back for a successful church. He's coming back for a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. How many know there's battles we fight? Can anybody relate to battles? Anybody? And this is how I fight my battles. You know why that song is so powerful to me? Because I'm not fighting for victory. I'm fighting from it. I'm not fighting for peace. I'm fighting from it. I may have a battle, but he's already won the war. There is no longer a cosmic fight between God and the devil 
Jesus settled that score 2,000 years ago on a cross called Calvary. Oh, and when he said it is finished and they buried him in a tomb and he conquered death, hell, and the grave and arose three days later. And that settled it. The enemy had no chance after that point to win the war. But there's a battle every once in a while that you got to face. But you're not facing it from the place of defeat or being the contender. You're the champion because Jesus is victorious on the inside of you. Isn't that good news? So I'm walking through it, but I'm doing it through the place of victory. Does this make sense to us this morning? Here's, here's where I'll end. People ask me all the time, David, are, are we living in the last days? And the answer is yes. We've been living in the last days for 2,000 years. The disciples were living in the last days. I know that we're, we're a day closer today than we've ever been, and I want to live like Jesus to come back at any moment. At the same time, I want to prepare for, for, for generations ahead so that I can blaze the trail for them, so that when, when I leave this earth, that I'm not just taking everything with me, but I'm leaving legacy in people, for people, with people. Would, can you agree with me on that? So we need to know how to navigate this season and time. And here's where I'll close. Can you can't improve on the methods of Jesus. John 16 and 33. Jesus said, I've told you all these things. What did he tell us? Oh, there's going to be a great falling away. People are going to hate you because of me. Persecution's going to come. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be famine. I've told you all of this. People are going to, all this stuff is going to happen. All of this craziness is going to be about. I'm telling you all of it. Okay? Why is he telling us? So we can be afraid? Is he telling us just so that we know, okay, the day of his appearing is soon? Maybe, but I don't think so. He's saying, I've told you all of these things so that in me you may have peace. So when you see all this stuff happening and all of the crazy and all of the swirl and all of the reports and all of the news and all of this and all of that, you don't freak out because you're in it but not of it because you're actually in me. He said in, in John 15, if you abide in me, I abide in you. So in me, you'll have peace, shalom, Nothing missing, nothing, provo- uh, nothing missing, nothing broken. In me, you'll have peace. Peace is your portion. Peace is powerful in this moment. And the Lord is saying, when all that is happening, I'm giving you an anointing to outpiece the enemy. You're going to outpiece the enemy. Stuff is going to come at you and you go, I'm in a place of peace because I'm in Christ. Jesus in me, I'm in him. In me, you'll have peace. Because in this world, you will have trouble. One translation, tribulation. Not the great tribulation, just tribulation. True translation of that is this. In this world, you will have pressure. But rejoice. Be of good cheer. Celebrate when all of it happens. Because I have overcome the world. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. Because I've got this. And many of you right now in this place, the Lord is about to release peace. I feel the peace of God in this room. It's the peace that passes all understanding. My friend says it like this. Sometimes in order to have the peace that passes all understanding, I have to give up my right to understand. That's good. And he is that. He's the Prince of Peace. When the boat is rocking, when the world around me is shaking, when when all of this unknown and uncertainty stuff is happening, he is my constant. Right now in this place, the presence of God is here. You know, I'm alive because my mama's prayers. I was suicidal, schizophrenic, attempted suicide 10 times the last time I was successful. Dropped dead in a pastor's office 12 miles away from where I was living after I took 250 prescription pills and a bottle of gin. He called the ambulance. They revived me. I was in a coma two and a half days on life support. They told my mother, you might as well forget you ever had this son. He's not going to live. If he does live, he'll be a vegetable. Won't walk, won't talk, won't be able to take care of himself. With the doctor still on the phone, my mom held the phone to her chest, sitting on her steps of her house in Chicago. Said, devil, you can't have my son. God, I don't know how you do what you do, but I trust you, and I'm asking that you make my son a miracle. 
I named him David because I always believed he'd be my little shepherd boy. Would you make my son a miracle? The Lord answered my mom's prayers and a bright light came in the room. And Jesus revealed himself to me. Called me son. Spoke to me about my identity. Told me I'd go around the world preaching the gospel wherever I go lives be touch and change. And all I can tell you is I died crazy, but I woke up in my sound mind. I died empty, but I woke up hungry. And, and there's a huge difference. And, and it's why I'm here today. Because in the midst of my mother's greatest storm, the Prince of Peace came in. In the midst of the, the greatest battle for my soul and my identity and my purpose, the Prince of Peace came in. And I just prayed this prayer. Nobody ever taught me. I made it up myself. God, if you can love me when I can't love myself, I'll serve you the rest of the days of my life. That's why I'm here. Can I tell you something? Cornerstone Church for the last 40 years has existed to be a light in the darkness, to be a habitation of hope and healing for Cheshire and Connecticut and New England and the nations of the earth. A place that God lives and people can learn and be equipped, discipled, and be sent out to the nations and to their neighbors. And all I can tell you is that 40 years have been great, but you've not seen anything yet compared to what you're about to see. Because the Lord's about to fill this place to overflowing with families and friends and community. And, and I just believe it with my whole heart today. I'm out of time. We've got to flip the service. Plus, you've got cupcakes waiting. I was in a restaurant recently. We were full from dinner. Tried to sell us on dessert. We said, no, we're really, really full. And the waitress said, you know, dessert doesn't go to the hips or to the stomach it goes to the heart so we had cannolis <laughs> just in case some of you felt like you know you couldn't have a cupcake just going to the heart today um, if you're in this room today you're watching online this morning and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life or maybe you find yourself away from God something I shared preached from the word of God this morning resonated in your heart you said I want to know God like that I have never made him the Lord and Savior of my life Today would be a really good morning to do that. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just want to pray for you. If you've never made Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, but you want to, you want to have a relationship with Him. It's not about religion. It's not about joining a church. It's actually about knowing God. It's about relationship with Him. The Bible says that all of sin fallen short of the glory of God. That's bad news. It means we all deserve to die and go to hell. But the good news is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, God raised him from the dead, then you're children of God. And so today, if you're away from God, you don't know him, or you, uh, maybe you've walked away from him at some point, you want to come back to him again. I don't want to embarrass you, just want to include you in that prayer. If you want me to include you in that prayer, I just want you to lift your hand up and put it right back down. They want to give my life to Christ today. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to know him uh, in, in all of his ways. I want him to come inside my life, be my Lord and Savior. Anybody in the room this morning? We had three in first service and a couple of people online. Maybe you're online watching today. You can just go ahead and use one of the hand emojis and say, I want to pray that prayer. And, and uh, so Lord, I just thank you right now for people coming to know you today, for a house that's light in the earth. Lord, I thank you right now for filling this place with your goodness and your glory and grace. In Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Uh, we're gonna have to go in a, in a second. Pastor Eric will come and give us some instruction. But I, I had a word for this young man in the in the middle in the blue shirt, similar to, to mine, your four row. Yep, you just, between the two guys in, in white shirts. That's prophetic, huh? Um, no, uh, brother, I just saw the hand of the Lord come on you, man. And I heard the Lord say that, that his desire is, is to prove himself to you and then through you. And I just felt like the Lord has given you this real tender heart towards the things of God. And I, I, I saw one word written over you that like it was flashing as, as sure as light. It was family. And family is so important to you. And I just felt like the Lord said that, that the Lord has given you an anointing to bring people together, to bring families together. And I saw the gift for whatever it's worth. You can walk it out, discover it as you go. But, but I heard the word pastor over you. And I believe the calling of a pastor is on your life in the way that you lead your family, but also the way you're gonna lead in the body of Christ. And today is a day where just the calling of God is, is, is coming upon you in Jesus' mighty name. My brother on the, on the aisle there in the, in the third row, I, I saw the Lord uh, and I saw the Lord like putting tools in your hands and it was like tools to build and tools to fix. 
And I felt like the Lord said that there, there is a grace coming upon your life, not to just work, but to actually work with the Lord. I had this vision or this thought for you that every day could be like going to work with your Father Day because you actually get to work with the Lord. You actually get to go to work with the Father. And I feel like there's some things that you've been doing for other people, with other people, helping other people in their business. And you almost put the dream of owning your own thing on the shelf. And some of you felt, maybe somehow you felt inadequate or it would never happen. But I'm telling you right now, it's time to dream again, my brother, that the Lord knows the dream and the desire of your heart. And what he loves about what you do is that when you're working, it's not really work, it's worship to the Lord. I feel like with every turn of the, the wrench and every hit of the hammer, it's, it's like worship to the Lord. And so, Lord, I thank you for the way that you know him intimately, the way that you know him, that though you are enough for him. In Jesus' name, for the young lady next to him, I, I just felt like the Lord was just singing over you. And I, I felt like the Lord said that he's actually, uh, this is gonna be a season of, of just hearing the, the love song of the Lord over you. And so, Lord, I thank you for the romance of God coming over her. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Lord, thanks for what you're doing at Cornerstone. Lord, thanks for letting me be a part of it for all of these years and for what you've done in the room this morning. In Jesus' name. I know Pastor Eric is coming and I know we're close for time, but Jesus the healer is here. And here's what I, I felt. I, I felt like the Lord was healing backs and hips. And I felt like somebody's back is kind of out, so it's thrown the hip out. I really felt it like, like on the right side. Is that anybody in the room this morning? Like it's, it's, if that's you, can you just stand up real quick? And so, Lord, right now, the Lord reveals to heal. Can, can we just believe that? The, the, the Lord reveals to heal. And, and what I love about Jesus is that because of the cross, because of, the, uh, of what he did for us, that healing actually belongs to us. Don't have to beg for it, don't have to, to, to plea for it, but, but healing belongs to us. And so, Lord, I thank you that healing belongs to us, that by your stripes we're healed. And Lord, I believe you allowed me to feel that today. You, you spoke that to my heart today because you want to heal my friends. And so right now, I release right now just the touch of heaven. I release right now the hand of Jesus Christ over these that have stood for that. Lord, right now, I speak to the back to come into alignment, the hip to be healed, pain to leave right now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, the same way you got saved is the same way you get healed. You believe it and you receive it. So Lord, right now, I thank you for that. And just throughout the day today, just try to move in ways that you haven't been able to move. And when the pain uh, lifts or it feels better or all the way healed, just thank the Lord for it. We're going to uh, enter it with thanksgiving, with praise. And so, Lord, thanks for that. In Jesus' name. I also felt like this, that there's hearts being healed today. I feel like there's physical hearts, like a, a racing heart. Uh, uh, and, and I feel like the Lord is settling that down, healing it right now in Jesus' name. But also, I felt like the Lord's healing the broken heart. And I feel like somebody who just, it comes from a place of relationship and the Lord's healing the broken heart today. And so just receive that right now if that's you. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Thanks for listening.